Namaste. So before we get into the detailed analysis of chapters 9 and 10, uh, I want to talk about Shiva Purana in general. I got a comment this morning by one viewer who <laughs> doesn't understand Shiva Purana at all. He thinks it's childish and it's like Greek and Roman mythology. But I guess he hasn't tried actually worshiping Shiva. Because as soon as you do, Shiva gives immediate results. And there's no more uh, doubts, no more speculation that, oh, this is just some silly mythology or some, some ancient legend. <laughs> no, this is real. And one of the things that supports the view of the reality of Shiva Purana is the fact that it completely harmonizes the four different views based on the four stages of consciousness. Now, I know I've showed this diagram a million times, but people still don't get it. The Dvaita Vada is the view of someone in Jagrat consciousness who thinks the world is real, the body is the self, and that they're the doer, and that there's cause and effect and all of that. The Vishishta Dvaita Vada is the view of a person in Svapna consciousness who is performing Bhakti Yoga. Uh, this happens naturally as the maturity of Karma Yoga leads to a great account, a great balance of good karma, subha karma. And then one becomes aware of one's relationship with God. And of course, this is only by the grace of God. So in this world, God is real. And the only way you can explain the existence of the world is by the existence of God. The so-called scientific explanation is based on a bunch of assumptions that break down as soon as you examine them. And it's a well-known philosophical issue that is it is impossible to prove the reality of the existence of the world. So the world is a dream. All right, even though it's a dream, it's still real from within the world, from the point of view of Jagra. <laughs> confirmed <laughs> and Swapna consciousness. But once one gets to a higher state of consciousness, starts performing Raja Yoga meditation and reaches the Vivartavada. <laughs> Vivartavada means the view that the world is an illusion. So anyone who actually engages in meditation, not just imitation, but the real thing, they come to the conclusion where they actually they get the experience, they get to see directly that the world is an illusion. And then finally, there's the Ajatta Vada, the view of one in Turiya consciousness, and who has transcended physicality, and whose point of view is outside the universe and who is situated in Brahman, the non-dual state. Up until that point, even if one uh, sees that the universe is an illusion, he's still in duality because he's still seeing the universe as a separate thing, as an object. But that view, that dualistic view, ceases when one attains self-realization in Turiya. So, Shiva Purana is unique in my experience, and I've read so many scriptures, you know, going back to being when I was a teenager, that 
It's the only scripture I've ever read that harmonizes these four points of view and integrates them into an actual practice that you can follow that yields step by step the entire spectrum of realizations from the lowest to the highest. And it also explains the existence of the world according to uh, theistic philosophy which is really the only explanation that makes sense. That there's a super powerful being, all knowing, all omnipresent, and who is all powerful, omnipotent, and who sets into motion this world and then delegates its various functions to the different created gods and so on and so on and so on. Exactly as explained in Shiv Purana. You say, well, we can't see these gods. So the, the empiricist, huh, so-called empiricist, rejects them. But you cannot see them because they're not subject to sense perception. They're subtle. So there are so many things that we accept, like gravity, for example, or electromagnetic radiation that you can't see either. Huh? And then you might say, well, well, we can see electromagnetic radiation by means of instruments. Okay, well, you can see God, too, through the instrument of worship, of bhakti. An intelligent person will not discount this argument, but will try it and see for themselves. So you want empiricism? That's empiricism. Huh? You, you try the process, you go in the lab and do the experiment, and you get the result. So, those who demean or deny the uh, veracity and authority of the scriptures are going to suffer. Well, they're already suffering. <laughs> They've lost their intelligence. They've become bewildered by atheistic and nihilistic arguments. And because of this, they're in a suffering condition of life. The world doesn't make any sense to them. They're grasping at straws like scientism and the mechanical, ex mechanistic explanation of reality, which can never be proved huh? because they're false. <laughs> so, the cure for this is to take the scriptures at their word and then try the process of worship as given in Shastra. And you'll see, you, you'll get the result. You'll see. So, beyond that, the remarkable thing about chapters 9 and 10 is that it explains Shiva Tattva. Tattva means a principle or a truth, uh, a, fat, a factor of existence. And so Shiva is one of the factors of existence. Shiva has to exist in order for anything else to exist. Because he is the bridge from non-duality, Brahman, to duality, the created universe. So to understand how something comes from nothing, or actually how nothing comes from something, <laughs> you have to understand Shiva. Shiva Tattva shows how the illusion of the material world is created from the reality of Brahman. So Brahman is the substance, just like Shiva says in chapter 9, I am the ingredient, just like gold is the ingredient of jewelry and clay is the ingredient of pots and other things made from clay. The clay doesn't change. It's clay when it's in the ground, it's clay when it's in the pot, and it's clay when the pot is broken and it goes back into the earth. In the same way, Shiva is the fundamental substance of everything. Brahman, pure awareness without an object. And how is it then that we see so much diversity in the world? And the answer is given in the Vedanta, that it's like seeing a snake, but it's actually just a rope. Uh, now, the snake 
does not exist in the rope. And similarly, the product uh, of causation, the material universe, does not exist in Brahman. In fact, it doesn't exist at all. <laughs> it's simply imagination. Huh? It's not that the snake is contained within the rope, even in a subtle form. But the snake is something that's projected onto the rope. It's an avyaya, a superimposition. And similarly, the material universe is a superimposition on Brahman. Brahman is the substrate, just like the rope is the substrate of the illusion of the snake. But the snake itself, since it doesn't exist, you can't say that it's been created. And when the illusion ceases and you see that, oh, actually it's a rope, you can't say that it's been destroyed because it never existed in the first place. <laughs> it's, we're going to cover all this philosophy in a separate video based on the Mandukya Upanishad. And um, I'm already working on that and I'll release it in a little bit. So the second part in chapter 10 is about the details of Shiva Tattva and how Shiva delegates his authority, even his authority of granting liberation to Vishnu and his power of creation to Brahma. And Brahma and Vishnu are like, you know, brothers. They want, uh, Brahma comes from the right side of Shiva's body and Vishnu comes from the left side. Now, I know I've said this a bunch of times before. You should really go and watch or hear or read these chapters because uh, a lot of what I'm saying is based on the details of those chapters and you won't really understand unless you go into it in detail. So do yourself a favor and understand these because the whole rest of Shiva Tattva and the whole rest of Shiva Purana is dependent on this understanding. How does Shiva manifest the world? Basically, he does it through his Maya, his power of illusion. So everything we're seeing, everything we're experiencing in this world is Maya. It's the great goddess, the illusion. And the goddess is fundamentally consciousness. Consciousness is awareness with an object. Brahman is awareness without an object. And you can experience all these things by practice of the disciplines given in the scripture. So if you actually uh, take the time to read the scripture and put into action the different spiritual processes described in there, then you will see these things for yourself. We're not just making this up, you know, but this is an experience that so many uh, liberated, enlightened beings have had. How? By following the instructions in the scriptures. It's said there, right there in the ninth chapter, that Shiva gave the Vedas to Vishnu and Brahma, and he also gave the supreme secret, which is the understanding of how Shiva creates the world and his own, his own nature. See, what is Shiva actually? What is Shiva Tattva? So to really understand it, of course, you have to meditate. This verbal knowledge is only Vidya. It's not Jnana. And see, this is another place where the neo advaitins make a mistake. They think by simple intellectual knowledge of the philosophical topics that they attain the same. But they don't. Because the actual realization is beyond words. But the words can help us. It's described there like a ladder. Huh? If you want to get up on the roof, like here I'm sitting on the roof, you have to climb up on something. You can't just jump up, huh? You'll hurt yourself. 
And similarly, you can't just jump up and pretend that you're enlightened and that everything is all one and that you're God and all this kind of nonsense. You'll fall down. And we see these people are claiming to be enlightened. They're claiming that, you know, oh, this Shiva Purana is just mythology. But then we see their actual life is that they're interested in all kinds of mundane things and they take shelter of material entertainment. <laughs> Talk about nonsense. I mean, they don't have deep insight. They don't have a, or experience a change of consciousness. And that's why we talk about four levels of views, four levels of consciousness, four kinds of yoga leading to the complete and perfect self-realization or total enlightenment. And that's all available in Shiva Purana. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.